Welcome. We are joined with uh, our new guest for this interview, Gonzalo Valdez, handsome young man. He's a member of the Tampa Bay Group Sierra Club, and uh, specifically, we were told your title is Beyond Coal Organizer. That's right. Can you can you uh, give us an example of what that doesn't include? Sure. I mean. At this point, uh, that includes pretty much all fossil fuels because we're seeing a lot of coal plants transitioning towards uh, frack gas. So really the fight to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is beating back against all fossil fuels. So we have about 10 coal plants in the state of Florida still remaining. So um, as we are transitioning away from these coals, as coal is becoming uneconomical, which it is right now, uh, we, we're fighting to see more clean energy solutions you know, instead of frack gas. Absolutely. Let, let, let's, before I jump the gun, yeah. give us your background. How sure. You, how you came into this, some education, yeah. where you're so, from. Yeah, um, so, you know, I started organizing officially in the 2012 election cycle. I worked for President Obama's campaign in Miami. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. I learned the, what people power can do. Uh, we won. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was an exciting time. Um, went to D.C., did some uh, organizing around fair housing. Uh, really learned how legislative... Um, you know, levers, you know, legal avenues can combine with organizing power to really move some big players. Uh, you know, we organize around banks up there to do fair housing work, and we're able to get some billion dollar commitments from some of the, wor the world's largest banks uh, to do more for fair housing work. Uh, for environmental work, um, you know, as I mentioned, I'm, I've always been a political kind of person for the last couple of years. It wasn't really until 2017 where the, uh, the itch around climate really got, um, really became something that I couldn't have avoid anymore and I had to scratch it. I, as we know, 2017 was one of the worst hurricane seasons we've ever seen uh, between Hurricane Harvey, what happened there, Hurricane Irma, and Hurricane Maria. Um, you know, the impact just became too real for me to ignore. I, uh, you know, I was involved in some grassroots relief work for Hurricane Irma. That opened my eyes to a lot of these new impacts from climate change, uh, but it wasn't really until uh, Hurricane Maria, because I have, I'm half Puerto Rican. And I was able to go over to, uh, to Puerto Rico shortly after, about three weeks after the storm, and seeing the level of devastation that a Category 5 does to um, areas that are not properly prepared, like Puerto Rico was, like most of Florida is currently, it really shook me. It, it showed me how we cannot rely on just federal assistance or um, even state or city level assistance because this problem is too complex and too large that if we're not proactively addressing it before the storm, then trying to clean up the mess after is just too much for any one entity to do. So that's where I really became invigorated around this fight around climate change, is that this is the new normal, these new massive storm systems, um, you know, rising temperatures. So we really have to get our act together in making sure that we're prepared and we're not continu continuously having to clean up these massive messes afterwards like we're doing with Hurricane Michael right now. Yes, we were in a discussion yesterday where there's also uh, a group of people, those people in weather who are much more brilliant than we are, considering a Category 6 right. because of those complications. Right. Yeah, I've, I've seen that too, a, a super, super cell. They, yeah, they, that's, Tampa is one of the few areas, or our region, Tampa Bay, is one of the few areas in the world where that's a possibility. So, you know, it's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We're, we're, when they talk about these 100-year events, the, la the last massive storm system that hit Tampa was 1921. So we're pretty much, I'm, I'm not a betting person. I don't get into gambling. But if I were, you know, the safe bet is that we're looking to see some type of one of those events, these massive storm systems, in the next 10 to 20 years, very likely, maybe as soon as this year. Right. We can we can say it's a Murphy's law. If it could happen, it might happen. I mean, it's just you never know. Our state has a history of our hurricane resiliency plan basically being a horseshoe and a rabbit's foot, and that's that's not enough. Oh, gosh. You know? yeah. We yeah. we really need to be better about not just leaving things to, you know, I've I've heard all kinds of ridiculous um, explanations as to why Tampa is bulletproof from hurricanes. You know, people saying that there's a you know, tombstones in the in the Gulf. Uh, people saying that there's a Cherokee, you know, um, curse or something. <laughs> I mean, I'm probably mixing up the the tribes on that. I apologize if I am, but um, you know, basically, no real concrete solutions. Only you know, urban legends as to why Tampa is and mystic. 
Right, and so as a one reason, as reasons why Tampa is um, is okay from hurricanes. This is something that I that I saw, you know, firsthand from my family in Puerto Rico. They, you know, they thought they were okay, and even in Irma, you know, that we were only hit with a Category One, and that was enough to knock people's power out in some regions for weeks. Right. And I can't tell you the the look of relief when we would show up to places with just ice, you know, just like a simple luxury like ice. Yeah. I mean, we take for granted how complex our lives are and how many layers there are to give us the level of comfort that we, we currently live with. And I'm here to tell you that it doesn't take much on a, on a climate front to really shake that up and to put us in a position where none of us want to be in. Exactly. And we have focus on the fracking. So, we, what, yeah. what we were talking about before you showed up sure. is that these, these terms, you know, for the commoners like myself, they're nebulous. Yeah. You know, I do have an experience elsewhere in Pennsylvania where fracking is, right. you know, all-time high and hitting it. I know a little bit of what went on there. But here, we, we use the terms. We don't fully understand in general what goes on. Sure. Where is the fracking to take place in, in the Tampa area? We, well, so, so this is the fracking, this, this issue with frack gas, um, they're not fracking in Florida yet. So the issue is they're going to be importing frack gas to get us our fuel. Now, most of this is going to be coming from like the Alabama region. Okay. Um, you know, that's where most of this fracking is happening. But even though fracking is not happening, the impacts of gas are very, are very serious and felt here. Because the thing with pipelines is that they're not safe and they leak a lot. So we're finding, uh, Rolling Stone just did a great expose on this called the, the, the Hidden Risks of the Fracking Boom. And basically what they're showing is that there's so much of these build-outs of these pipelines going on that the regulation isn't keeping up to make sure these pipelines are safe. We're seeing pipelines failing that are built in the last, pipelines that were built in the last 10 years are failing at the same rate as pipelines built in the 40s. So, and another interesting fact is that methane leaks from these pipelines are industry reported. So the industry always underreports these. And whenever you get studies, you know, by third-party groups, so like nonprofits like EDF, for example, the Environmental Defense Fund, they teamed up with Google Maps to do a study of a lot of major cities in the United States. One of the cities they looked at was Jacksonville. Jacksonville has TECO pipes, and it, which is you know, something we're going to be talking about today, uh, their gas um, you know, dependence and why it's a problem. Those TECO pipes in Jacksonville showed a leak every nine miles. Every nine miles. And this is hundreds and hundreds of, if not thousands of miles of pipes. So you're, you're talking about a lot, a lot of leaks that people are unaware of. And they can cause serious, serious implications. You know, we saw just last year 19 pipelines exploding. So, you know, when, when we're talking about safety concerns, you know, fracking obviously is a huge problem. I'm not here to say that fracking isn't something we shouldn't be concerned about because as long as we're getting our, get, as long as we're fueling our energy from gas, we're contributing to fracking somewhere. Now, by adding to the demand for fracking, we open up the conversation in the future for Florida to be fracked. And that is ultimately of concern for us because as we know with the water table here, the way that the aquifer is, fracking in one place in Florida will be felt all over the state. So we, we just can't afford a huge investment in frack gas. And if I can, just indulge me for one second here. Mm -hmm, please. Fracking, frack gas is what we need to be calling it. A lot of people call it natural gas. Yeah. But in reality, there's nothing natural about it because over two thirds of this stuff and the majority of the stuff that we're seeing here in our area is coming from fracking. So it's very much a, an industry term, natural gas, to make people feel like it's less onerous, like it doesn't have as much of an environmental impact. Right. It's somehow cleaner. We hear, we hear this, this nonsense being spit all the time about it being cleaner. But when people talk about it being cleaner, they're not including the methane leaks, the, the damages from fracking that this does to people's water supply, land, you know, the, the livestock in those areas, you know, cancer rates, um, you know, skyrocketing areas where, where fracking happens. These are all impacts that are are directly related to get using gas as an energy source. So, you know, and whenever you think, whenever someone says the term natural gas to you, just think clean coal, because it's basically the same thing. It's, it's an industry term to make people feel safer using it, but there's absolutely nothing safe about it. Right, and, and we were talking about TECO is now moving forward to uh, project building. Yeah. A, a new one now, which yeah. is going to work for another how many years? 50? 30 to 40 years, possibly 50. Of, of yeah. basically old technology. Right. We're, exactly. we're not, here in the Sunshine State, yeah. where that free energy source is available, right. we're not tapping into it. Yeah, I like to give the metaphor of this is as if, like, in the mid 90s, the government said, hey, let's buy everybody a dial up modem to get them on the internet. Because, <laughs> you know, it seemed like the right investment at the time, like, that's what everybody's using, but, the, 
you know, anybody who was in the know of the, the technology knew that right around the corner, if not at that moment, you know, broadband and, uh, you know, landlines were, or broadband internet was much more viable and it, for long-term use. So we're basically in that same position right now. We have a dying technology that they're doing everything they can to prop up because they want to make money off of it. Tico makes money not just burning gas, but they also make money piping it into the state. Make money. Yes, they have they have two companies that make money from gas. They have Tico Energy, which is the the one that distributes energy from burning at power plants, but also they have Tico People's Gas, which is a gas delivery network that covers about 80% of the state. So not only are they making money burning it at the fossil at the plant site, but they also make money transporting it in and out of the state. So it's just another way so of been charging us twice. Well, yeah, exactly. They're they're making money coming and going. It, they're double dipping on profit. This is of ultimate concern when you really look look at Tico's corporate profile. You know, they were recently purchased by a Canadian company called Amera. And Amera, interestingly enough, and I, I gotta remind people, this is the same company. Even though it's the parent company and the child, it's basically just an extension of the same company. It, they basically share the same. You know, the the person that's the CEO of Tico right now used to work for Amera. And there's a, there's a whole connection there where there's no reason why Amera, who has clean energy commitments of 40% in, in Canada, which is their home base, 100% clean energy commitment in Barbados, should be operating this way in Tampa. We have a commitment of here in Tampa of over 90% fossil fuel use. They want to keep us over 93% reliant on fossil fuels through 2030. Who, who wants to keep us on? Tico does. And well, in Amera by extension, because it's the same company. So while Amera is operating under a clean energy hat and saying how great they are for using clean energy in, you know, in Nova Scotia where they operate, in Barbados, um, they have no such plans for Florida. And it's, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous because we stand to suffer the most from climate change. You know, I, I don't know what sea level rise projections are like off the top of my head in Nova Scotia, but I know for a fact that Tampa is the number one city susceptible to storm surge. So, why are why is Tico doing things in Florida that Amera would never do in Canada? That's what I don't understand, and that's something that I think everybody needs to ask Tico. Is saying, if it's not good for Canadians, why do you think it's good for Floridians? It's a very good point, and ha they've not put anything out. No, in their public, they don't have a a person who takes care of this publicity or fix fix it kind of person. Yeah, they, of course. They, they're, they're a billion dollar corporation that has a PR department that when we ask them about it, they they give us every under, excuse under the sun from cloud coverage to uh, land use, all these types of things that, you know, I, I just feel like sending them a simple Google search on just, you know, like what other utilities are doing in the, in the country. I mean, we're seeing um, like XL Energy in Colorado, a place that gets much less sunshine than the Sunshine State. Mm -hmm is completely skipping coal and gas and moving straight to solar plus battery. Uh, Arizona also doing, they just committed last week to do about 900 megawatts of solar and battery. So it's, it's not a matter of, of ability, it's a matter of will at this point. Wow. We, you know, and this is the really interesting thing, is that Amera, again, you know, Tico, same company, you know, the mm -hmm. parent company, um, Amera has reported that they get about 39% of their earnings, of their, of their revenues, from Tico. So this is a massive corporation that operates all over the all over the country. They have they have uh, they have they have operations in Maine. They have operations in New Mexico, Barbados, Canada, and almost half of their profits come from this one small utility in Florida, Tico. And while they're using all this profit to do these clean energy investments all everywhere else, they have us committed on this fossil fuel path, which is setting us, setting us up for catastrophic failure. I mean, y'all are savvy, uh, you know, in, intelligent people. I'm sure y'all saw the UN report that recently came out that said we have about 12 years to act on climate change, right? Yeah. Which really, that was released about, you know, I think September last year. We have more like 11 and a half years right now, right? So back to what you were saying about this being a 30 to 40 year investment. If we allow this to happen, we're basically on that worst, we're on that course to get us to worst case scenario where sea level rise will be too much for us to be able to do anything about, and we're basically guaranteeing that Florida becomes the next sunken civilization. When you hear about Atlantis and Al things like yeah, that, I was just gonna say Atlantis. we're basically setting ourselves up to be the next Atlantis. And you know that's something that I is unacceptable for me personally. I grew up in Florida. I love this state. I think it is one of the, the hidden treasures in the world in terms of just the diversity, the, 
the culture, the you know, the weather, everything. It's a to me, it's a beautiful place that I would never want to leave. But the reality is, people are going to be forced to leave due to climate change unless we act with the utmost urgency. Uh, otherwise, we'll end up like Miami. I don't. I, I guess they've solved some of their problems. Well, though. solve is a. I mean, they're they're coming up with with solutions. I wouldn't consider it solved though, because you know the worse and worse it gets, the more they're gonna. Have, right now, they're currently spending hundreds of millions of dollars on seawalls and build like bilge pumps, things to clear their streets to make sure that flooding doesn't happen every single day. But does this this is just gonna keep getting worse and worse the more the sea level rises. So you know, of, and you know while we're on the subject of sea level rise and climate change. Tico actually in this plan that, you know, this $858 million plan that they're asking for the customer's money. I got to remind people about this. This is, this is rate payer money. This is, this means if you're paying a Tico bill, it's your money that's going to this. This is not coming from any Tico um, investment or no. no, this is straight coming from the customers. So in this plan, they're actually proposing to build a 20 foot seawall because this power plant sits on the water. They want to build a 20-foot seawall and raise parts of their facility by about 13 and a half feet. So while their actions are speaking louder than their words on this. Yeah, why would they have to if... Well, climate change. I mean, they, they currently have a seawall there. It's about 8 feet. But they're proposing to raise it to 20 feet. So, you know, when we've asked them, like, don't you understand how you're acknowledging climate change through this? They're like... Well, you know, they don't they don't want to publicly acknowledge it's a problem because then they have to do mitigation for the whole surrounding community because then the, the jig is up, right? It's like you're causing climate change, you're preparing for climate change, but you're not doing anything for anybody else. Why is that? And they don't want to acknowledge it. That's why Sierra Club is engaged in the Tell the Truth Tico campaign. If you look up hashtag, uh, you know, the, the pound sign hashtag, uh, Tell the Truth Tico, uh, we have a lot of great information about this. And we're, we started this campaign because we want them to quit lying to the public about what their plans are and making people think that this is somehow a cleaner, greener investment, which is a lie that they're, they're out there saying. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Part, part of the problem we've also been discussing is that uh, the state of Florida has no third party mm. energy company to right. come in. The law prohibits that. So right. what are your, what are your Tallahassee plans? I mean, <laughs> this is the seat. This is where you'd have to go and yeah, change I, minds. I mean, there is a ballot initiative out there right now, which I don't know enough about to say for for or against it, because there's, there's the devil's in the details with it. But I do I will say that deregulating the markets is a strategy that has worked in other states. Um, you know, like for example, Texas. They they deregulated a couple years back, maybe I think it was like 12 years or so ago, and um, they saw after they deregulated their utilities to allow people to buy from whoever they wanted, they saw clean energy investments actually increasing. Hmm. So it's, it's interesting, when the free market spoke, people demanded clean energy and it won in that competitive process. To where now Texas gets about 12% of their energy from clean energy. Whereas Florida, last time I checked, it was about half a percentage point we got from clean energy. Yeah. You know, which is second worst of any state in the country. Only, only losing to Delaware in that discussion. And Texas is an oil state. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, is that that's even more. Texas is where, you know, the, the, the oil barons of the, you know, the, the people that have literally invested their whole lives and their whole legacy in fossil fuels, right. that's, that's Texas for you. And if Texas can see the writing on the wall for fossil fuels and start to move towards clean energy, why is Florida a place that gets more sunshine, that has more rooftop solar available space? You know, T Tampa, Florida was actually... Uh, rated as the eighth most solar rooftop ready city in the entire country. Oh my gosh. Why is it that we are so far behind the curve in solar energy and just clean energy solutions when other states, you know, like New Jersey, for example, New Jersey gets more solar energy than Florida. That's absurd. That is absurd. You know, North Carolina gets more solar energy than Florida. Why, why is this? When, we, and when you really dig into it, you start to find out that, you know, like most... Uh, most uh, issues these days, the regulatory process is not keeping up with the issues, mm -hmm. and the corporate power is really influencing these decisions at the, at the very top, at the governor's level, at the cabinet's level, at the, the public service commission level, where this stuff all gets decided. It, it becomes basically toothless regulation, and these utility companies get to do whatever they want and then pass the cost on to the ratepayers. There was actually, USA Today 
just last month uh, in February did an excellent piece on how utility companies are overcharging their ratepayers by billions, you know, on these big expensive projects, and who gets stuck paying for that? The ratepayers, us, you sure. know. So and it's it's all just to maximize profits because, you know, they, the big the big cost with all these things is the fuel costs. When you're talking about solar energy, of course there's enough for costs. There's no there's no free rides, right? Like if we're gonna do solar energy, we're gonna have to spend some money. But we're already spending money, you know, in this proposal. What we're saying is spend that money on a wise investment that's gonna save us in the long term. We actually found through our intensive analysis that if Tico did a clean energy solution as opposed to this gas project, they would save about two billion dollars. Oh. Close it's a to no one point eight billion is the number we came up with. So it really is a no brainer. You know, because you know, besides the upfront cost, you know, you're you're basically getting free energy from that point. You know, the only cost really at that point is maintenance. But with gas, you know, they can't tell you what the cost of gas is going to be in five years, ten years, twenty years. They actually just this year are raising rates four percent because of an increase in gas. An, un, an unforeseen in quotes for since you can't see me, I'm doing the quote fingers. Uh, the unforeseen cost increase in cost of gas. So. You know, when we when we talk about the economics of this, it's it's very clear, and we're not even getting into the health impacts, the climate change impacts. You know, we can we can get into that too. But if we're just talking dollars and cents, you know, just from just the cost of doing this and what it's going to cost over the life of the plant, clean energy wins every single time. And when I when I say clean energy, I mean solar plus battery in the in the sunshine state. So who who would be the the politicians or the people? Who? How could we affect a change? Yeah. Who would we uh, call or do? And I think we went over this a little bit in, with our uh, other guest, uh, Mr. Bailey. Yeah. But I want to reiterate it because it's important for people to hear this. Right. So there's a big hearing coming up on March 11th. Right. Uh, where this will be the big opportunity for people to come out and share their voice on this. Um, I don't know if this is going to air before or after that. So We're going to make uh, sure it airs before. Okay. Before. So, you and Ken get... <laughs> Oh, top, top see, see guys, we'll see you there on the 11th. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so anybody who's a, who is a TICO rate payer, meaning if you get a bill from TICO, or if you're just a Floridian who doesn't want to see your state go underwater, um, this, this decision is going to impact the world, literally, because we, if Florida keeps dragging its feet on this, we're going to set the tone for the conversation for other states, you know? So we, we really need to be an energy leader and not an energy follower. And we're seeing, like I mentioned before, we're seeing other states really taking that ball and running with it. Just uh, this last month, uh, the city of LA canceled its plans for some gas plants, and they're actually replacing those with solar and battery. So it, again, it's not a matter of if it can be done, it's a matter of who has the will to do it. That's a question, I think, back to your question about you know, what elected officials, um, we have some great you know, environmentalist elect electives down here on county commission, city council, um, just with the mayor's race for, in Tampa also, there's a, every single candidate there pledged to making Tampa a 100% clean energy city. So holding them to that, if they consider themselves environmentalist, if they consider themselves somebody who loves Florida, make sure that they give them, write them a letter, uh, give them a call, let them know, hey, we cannot afford a massive fossil fuel investment. As the Sunshine State, we deserve better from our utility company. Um, also that March 11th hearing, if you are in the area, it's going to be at the Riverview Hilton. Uh, Hilton Garden Inn. Um, 4328 Garden, Vista Drive. Uh, everyone try and be there by 5 p.m. And before you come, call your county commissioners. Yes. And tell them, now their phone numbers and addresses if you want, uh, email addresses. Uh, I'll put on our webpage. Just type in Why Mama Mamas and it'll, and it'll come up. And scroll down and you'll, you'll see that I've listed them already once, I'll list them again for you. Also, since this is going to be decided at the state level, um, you know, state level reps or senators are very helpful in, mm -hmm. um, you know, spreading this message. So I know Adam Hattersley, I spoke with him about... He's wonderful, yes. I spoke with him uh, about a month ago. He was great. He, um, he really understood these issues. He has a background in utilities. Um, so he really understood this and he was very much on board with this. So um, give him a call, tell him, you know, thank you for supporting uh, the work of Sierra Club and to make sure that he, um, you know, understands that this is something that his constituents don't want. Because ultimately that's who they're here to answer to. They're not here to answer to any, you know, utilities or groups. It's more, it's, it's about the people that vote for these electeds. So if you are, if you voted for somebody who considers themselves a champion of this area, of you know, the South Shore area, or even just the state of Florida, 
let them know that if they truly are champions of this, they need to stand with their constituents. And we will have all those phone numbers. Uh, they're already on there, but please go on to uh, Why Mama Mamas and uh, in Facebook. And Twitter and Instagram. And you will find uh, all the information you need to contact your uh, representatives.